Welcome to RJI's podcast series hosted by RJI President Lisa Ray. Restorative Justice International is an association and network of over 6,000 members and affiliates. In this podcast series, Lisa interviews leaders from around the world who support restorative justice, including crime victims, ex-offenders, exonerees, and human rights experts. In these podcasts, you will hear from key thought leaders who support systemic justice reform based on restorative justice principles. Now, here's Lisa Ray. Today's guest is Robbie Damelin. This podcast is recorded from outside Tel Aviv, Israel. Robbie is an Israeli peace activist and works with Parents Circle Families Forum. Robbie's son, David, was killed by a Palestinian sniper on March 3rd, 2002. Welcome, Robbie. So good to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we talked recently via Zoom, and now I want um, the listeners of Restorative Justice International to, to hear your story. I didn't give you much of an inter- introduction, so please give me a more expanded one. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Um, well, where shall I start? If you hear my accent, you can be sure that I come and was born in South Africa. And a lot of who I am today is probably the influence of being in the anti-apartheid movement of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And my life in general and my family in South Africa, uh, where I had an uncle who defended Mandela in the first treason trial, and a very strange distant cousin who walked with Gandhi from Peter Maritzburg to Johannesburg um, in the beginning when he started and got the idea uh, all his ideas, and the same strange cousin gave him uh, his first farm in South Africa. So maybe it's in the genes, I don't know. Um, I came to Israel in 1967 to save Israel in the Six-Day War. Didn't do a very good job. Uh, I landed up working in a chicken house on a kibbutz. So that was very mainly my contribution to the Six-Day War. Um, it seems that life here is just all about wars. All I can, you know, I can't even remember the names of all the wars, and now they're arguing about what they should call this war. I think they should call it a disaster, but, you know, uh, the powers that be. Um, after the kibbutz, my first job in Israel was with the Jerusalem Post, which in those days was a much more liberal newspaper. I came to live in Tel Aviv afterwards, uh, after I studied Hebrew. Well, let's say I didn't do much studying, but I went to a school for Hebrew in Jerusalem. And after working at Jerusalem Post, moved to Tel Aviv. Um, I got married and had two kids, um, David and Iran. And uh, we lived on a moshav, which is something like a kibbutz, but it's like a private farm. Uh, after when they were about six and seven, got divorced and came to live in Tel Aviv. And my kids grew up in a very liberal, open house um, with friends from all sides of the world. And um, when it came to go to the army, that was when it became difficult. You know, I remember standing at the bus stop and watching Iran um, get onto the bus when he was inducted into the army and being given a gun and couldn't believe that a child of mine would actually carry, carry a gun. And I remember standing with David with tears pouring down my face. And then uh, it was David's turn. There was a year and a month difference between them to go to the army. And David actually went to a music school and studied the French horn and conducting. And he was the last person I ever thought would go to a fighting unit. But there you are. And how old um, was he at the time? When he went to army, 18, like all kids go to the army when they're 18. Uh, unless you know, they can find a good enough excuse not to. And, of course, there are some conscientious objectors, but I think if you grow up in this country, you are surrounded by this dilemma of having to serve and having to protect. And um, I, I remember once they came home from the army, they were very tall, like six foot uh, two, something like that. 
um, both of them came home from the army and we were having lunch and we had quite a lot of wine. And then I suddenly saw two of these huge boys crying because they couldn't bear what they were actually doing in the army. Uh, each of them, when they finished the army, ran away. Iran went to India uh, for more or less a year and David to South America. That's not uncommon. That happens to most kids who want to escape for a year after the army. Uh, he came, David came back in Iran and they started to study and David was studying for his masters in the philosophy of education. And he was teaching kids who were going to be inducted into the army philosophy. Actually, the last picture I have of him is him standing in a toga um, because he had a feast for Plato. That's the last picture I have of him. Um, then he was called to go to the reserves. And he came to talk to me because David had signed the letter that many officers in the army signed not to serve in the occupied territories. And this was the first time in his reserves that he was actually called to go to the, um, to the occupied territories and he really didn't know what to do. And he came and we had this long conversation and he said, if I don't go, what will happen to my soldiers? He was the officer. And is that the right example to the kids I'm teaching who are going to be inducted into the army? So I say this all the time, that you don't always know who the person is behind the gun and what, what decisions they've had to face to be where they are. Um, I was filled with a sense of, of dread, but he went anyway. And he was killed by a Palestinian sniper along with nine other people. And actually, if I interweave the story now, it took three years and they caught the man who killed David. And everybody thought I would be rejoicing with that. But actually, that's when it came to face whether I'm really honest. You know, do I mean what I say? Because very soon, well, when, when the army came to tell me that he'd been killed, the first thing I said apparently is you can't kill anybody in the name of my child. So there was something there already, and I knew very soon that I wanted, um, I wanted to do something to prevent other families from experiencing this pain. And so um, I spoke at a very big demonstration, and the parents' circle heard me. And they came to talk to me and invited me to a weekend in East Jerusalem to meet other bereaved Palestinian and Israeli families. And I remember sitting around this table and looking into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and realizing, mainly the mothers, was that, <coughs> pardon me, if we could stand on the stage and talk in the same voice uh, for reconciliation and nonviolence and ending the occupation, then that would be an example for everybody else, because if we, as two bereaved mothers from the conflict, from opposite group, uh, sides, could do that, surely that's an example to other families. Um, I think it must have been half a year, maybe even less after that, I closed my office and decided that I would devote my whole life to this organization. And why don't you just... Um Describe the organization, too. I, I did just do a podcast with your friend, Bazam. Well, if you'll hang on, I'll, I'll come to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just be patient. If, uh, <laughs> if you want to ask a question, just stop me. But um, I promise you, you'll get the whole story. Okay? Absolutely. So I started to travel all over the world with a Palestinian partner. Uh, we spoke in House of Lords, in the Congress, in the Canadian Parliament, uh, in the Senate, everywhere, in a hip hop concert in, in San Francisco, wherever anybody would invite us. And I was quite pleased with myself. You know, I thought, well, this is very nice. I can speak English. Everybody understands what I'm saying. 
the Americans seem to think I'm British, which is hilarious, because the British think my accent is appalling. Anyway, I came back to Israel and one night I was sitting next to my computer and there was another knock on the door and I opened the door and there were three soldiers. When you see three soldiers, it only means one thing. So I kept slamming the door in their face. And then eventually I opened the door and they said, we came to tell you that we caught the man who killed David. That came, that was a test. What was I going to do with that information? Because it's all very well going around the world talking about um, love and peace and, I don't know, rainbows and flowers and all of that stuff. But now I'm faced with the person who actually did it. There's a person. And what am I going to do with that? Can I do this work in integrity if I'm not willing to go through some kind of um, process with him? Um, I don't think I slept for three months. Literally not. I was walking around my house completely um, in some kind of daze to know what it was, what is the right thing to do. And then one morning I just woke up and within 10 minutes wrote a letter to the, to the family of the man who killed David. And by the way, I'm a great believer in letter writing. Um, when you lose somebody and it's instant, uh, and you write letters to say goodbye, and that's a good tip for people who lost through COVID, who never got a chance to say goodbye. Um, so in the letter, I told him about the parent circle. We are a group of more than 700 families now who have all lost an immediate family member to the conflict. It's more or less half Israeli, half Palestinian, maybe more Palestinians. Um, the long-term vision of this organization is to create a framework for a reconciliation process to be a part of any future political peace agreement. Because without that, all that we can expect is another um, ceasefire until the next time. Um, I think that the parent circle is probably unique I don't know of another organization in the world that's actually working for reconciliation while the conflict is going on. I do know of organizations, obviously, that work together after, after a conflict. In the letter that I wrote to the family, I also told them about David, and I told them that I thought it was we should meet because we owed that to our children and grandchildren. And um, two Palestinians from our group delivered the letter. And of course, you could imagine how surprised the family were to get a letter from the mother of somebody their son had killed. And they were, I think they wanted to actually, they said that if everybody would sign on this letter, maybe there could be peace. Um, I'm not the most passionate character in the Middle East, so I imagine that there'll be you know, that there'll be a letter from the sniper almost immediately. People don't realize that reconciliation is not necessarily something that happens overnight. It may never happen. And so after three years, I got uh, a message from him over a website where he said I was crazy and that I should stay away from his family because he killed 10 people. David was killed along with nine other people, three civilians to free Palestine. But I knew differently from his parents because his parents told us that when he was a little boy, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army. And he lost two further uncles in the second uprising. And so I think this was much more an act of revenge. He wasn't really politically affiliated. Um, he could decide in jail to either be with the Hamas or the Fatah which are the two parties he chose to be with Fatah. He became a kind of a folk hero. And people, uh, he wrote a book about him and made a film about him. Um, it was like a turning point for me when I got that letter because it was giving up being a victim. I don't even call myself a survivor. I think I'm a victor. You know, a survivor for me also has a connotation which isn't exactly what I how I see myself. 
So I went back to South Africa and we made a film, a documentary about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it was also, um, for me, we met perpetrators and victims, but for me it was very much looking um, to understand the meaning of forgiving. And I met this extraordinary woman, she was a South African who lost her daughter and had gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and said to the three men who had killed her daughter, I forgive you. So I wanted to know, and today, wherever I go and whatever lectures I give, if it's a small room, I ask people to tell me their definition of forgiving. I don't think I've actually got the monopoly on truth. And so um, I, after being in South Africa, I also went to meet this woman. And she said, I said, well, by the way, it? what's her name? Her name is June Forey. I asked her what her definition of what what was her definition of forgiving. And she said, forgiving for me is giving up your just right to revenge. And then I met the man who actually sent the people who killed her daughter. Her daughter wasn't the target, she just happened to be in this pub where they shot, where they shot up and killed various people. And um after she said, I forgive you, I wanted to know, what did she mean? And so I went to meet her and she said, forgiving for me is giving up your just right to revenge. And then I met the man who actually sent the people who killed, who killed her daughter. And he said, by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. That for me is one of the most important sentences that I ever heard. Um, that spurred me on when I came back to Israel after we made the film, which opened a whole lot of doors all over the world, uh, because people are hungry for that kind of thing. You know, there's so little hope anywhere. Um, and uh, when I came back, I tried to meet with the man who killed David. Uh, it's quite difficult here because first thing I got in those days, uh, there was a minister of justice who was willing to let me go in to the prison. And we waited and the police then came up with um, all kinds of stumbling blocks. And what happened was there was an election, not unusual for Israel. And uh, there was a new minister of justice who had no intention of letting me do anything. But the fact is that the law says that he has to, the man who committed the crime, has to ask to meet me, which I think is insane. And I hope that the world will fight that law because I, I, I can't see any sense in that at all. I believe in restorative justice and, and I can't believe that there's no way that I can actually get there. I, I tried to phone his lawyer, the sniper's lawyer, and um, he promised that he would talk to him and see if he could get him to write me a letter. So where does this interwoven into everything? It's about now for the hostages that are here during the war that were taken by Hamas, um, one of the conditions is to free the prisoners. So actually this week I wrote an op-ed in Haaretz in which I said that they, I don't care if they free the man who killed David, if it brings back one, one hostage, it will be worth anything, because I believe in the sanctity of human life. And that ran this week, your op-ed? Yes, it was on, I don't know, Wednesday, I think. What's today? Thursday. Yeah. It was on Thursday, twenty first. It was on Sunday in English and on Monday in Hebrew. Hmm. And um, how much time did your offender do in prison? How much time did he? Did yeah. He, did he get to be? Yes. Life. Um, he killed ten people plus injured various of the people uh, who were there. So it's a life sentence, but. What happened is there was a soldier called Gilad Shalit uh, who was in prison in Gaza for five years. 
And we, at the parent circle, we had been um, supporting the family and there was this question of freeing uh, prisoners, but hardcore prisoners, not, you know, small uh, offences. And um, we supported the family all along. And I went to the television in those days and said they should free the man who killed David if that will bring back Gilad Chalit. So this is nothing new. You know, this I had already in me all these years. And um, we will see what this will create. Uh, some of the families of the hostages have been in touch with me now because they're clutching onto any straw, you know. And I don't know if there are other parents. And I certainly can't speak for the other people who were killed, you know, in that incident for the families of the others killed. That's not my right. I can only, and I'm not his jailer, the country is his jailer. But if it's up to me, I would release him. If it would just bring back, you know, there's this symbol of those little baby with the ginger. It's one of the hostages. And I keep thinking to myself, if they would release just that family, that would be extraordinary. I think that baby just turned a year. And let me ask you again about uh, um, the offend your offender. Um, so, um, as you said, the offender has to ask for the meeting, not you. Yeah, right. And, and um, I think I told you in the last conversation we had, so Restorative Justice International, we take a strong position supporting a victim's right to restorative justice, and we think it should be in statute, and clearly it's not there. Now, why, why do you think that um, that's the position of the government? I think because people are not really aware of restorative justice in that, you know, it's not, I, I know that for petty crimes, uh, there, there is the basis of restorative justice. It's not like Italy, which now has it in its constitution. Um, restorative justice is now part of the legal system there. I wish it was here. But it isn't. So, I mean, I do know that there are perpetrator victim meetings. But if it would be this kind of thing, you know, with with uh, so-called conflict murder, then uh, I hope that they're not. Uh, I asked a lawyer, two lawyers, who both told me that that's the law. So I haven't given up completely. But the thing is that it's not really that important to me anymore. You know, I feel I'm released from this anyway. Yes. I'm so at peace with myself. Um, it was a sense of wanting completion. I wasn't looking for um, any apologies or, or anything like that. I wanted to understand why from him. I think that was much more what I wanted. So, but I'm almost immune at this point. I'm so involved in so many things that have so much meaning. And it's like such a sense of gratitude that I have in my life for actually being a part of change for other people. You can't imagine what it's like to meet a mother, a Palestinian mother, who said if she met the man who killed her child after 100 years, she'd kill him. And see her today after she had an emotional breakthrough of realizing that we share the same pain. Um, Today, she's one of the most uh, active members of the parent circle in the women's group. So, you know, how many people get that opportunity in their life? So with yes. all the sadness and with all, all the missing of David, which is daily, hourly, I still think I have a lot to be grateful for. I've met the most extraordinary people all over the world who've gone through um, victim, perpetrator, uh, processes and have come out so grateful. But in your case, uh, we work with a lot of victims of violent crime around the world, and and not everyone is at the point that you're at. Um, they, um, like you said, if they have a dialogue, um, often there is a breakthrough, and and sometimes there's forgiveness, but not always, as you said. Um, but there's certainly understanding. As you just described, I think of the, that word and think of Joe Barry's life. Um, and I know she's a friend of yours and she works with us. And and she um, she got me to understand that, that it's not always um, forgiveness. It's the goal, but it's certainly understanding is important and and helps with a person moving on 
even in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was no clause for forgiving. And in fact, many of the victims were very pleased that they didn't have to give amnesty to the criminals and that it was a government thing. And, and I think forgiving is so um, personal, you know, and I don't even, I don't really, I'm so, I know it sounds strange, but I'm very at peace with myself and I don't have any fear. And I think the fear, um, I've come to, to think of late that if you meet the other and you don't have the fear, it's very releasing. You know, I saw my grandson uh, went to the summer camp. Now, he's a kid that's like just turned 14. Every year we have a summer camp for Israelis and Palestinian bereaved kids. And this kid is Israeli average, pretty spoiled, came with me to London, did all the good things in life, like Harry Potter and all of that stuff. And um, he went to the ceremony that we have every year. We have a ceremony on Memorial Day. For Palestine, it's actually Memorial Day for Israeli soldiers, but the parents' circle and combatants for peace have a combined evening of commemorating both sides, the loss of both sides. So I took my grandson. I don't force them to be peacemakers or anything. I think it's personal. And he was really moved and he came and he went to the summer camp, which we had a tremendous problem this year with the government. Um, they tried to stop the summer camp. And at the end of the summer camp, he said, wow, this is the best week I've ever had. And I suddenly realized that we alleviated his fear of the other because he didn't know any Palestinians before. He never mixed with kids his own age who were Palestinian. And that alleviating fear is a huge step that we must take in peacemaking. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. I, I'm thinking of a case of a woman that works with us in Ireland, Alba Griffith. She was brutally sexually assaulted, feared for her life. And um, no, she, I mean, I've heard her talking. Yeah, it's an incredible witness. But she, um, she met with the offender in prison. And um, just like you, she had to find restorative justice on her own. It was never offered. But she heard about it and then found a, a professor the University of Dublin, Marie Keenan, um, to help her. But what was so unusual is that a, a film was made about her where she was in it, um, playing herself. The offender wasn't um, the real offender. I mean, it was an actor. But what she said in the film was that when she walked into the room and actually met the man, she said to herself, he's just a man. And her fear, like you said, she didn't say fear, but I think this is exactly what it was. It was gone. Well, and also I can tell you, I think with losing a child, you also lose your fear because what the hell else can happen to you that's worse than that? I don't think anything actually. Right. right. So I'm not fearful. You can put me anywhere in front of 20,000, 50,000, 10 people. It doesn't matter. I don't ever prepare anything because it's not about the fact that I'm some genius. It's just the fact that when you believe what you're doing, you know, and it becomes who you are, there's no need to, to start writing an academic book about why you think something. Uh, and your story is what tells the, the, tells the story. Your story. Let, let me ask this, and then I'll move on to a couple other questions. So in your case with your offender, why do you think he said no to you? Oh, uh, I don't know what, I, it's very difficult to know because there's the hierarchy in prisons. He could not do anything without the, the bosses in the prison telling him it's okay to do that. Um, in the beginning, he said, um, you know, when he wrote the letter, he said, I was crazy, that whole letter. But then um, when we were making the film, the documentary, he went, uh, my, uh, the filmmakers went to see him in prison, they weren't allowed in the prison, but with the lawyer, with his lawyer. And his lawyer spoke to him, and then he said, well, he's willing to meet me, but uh, because both of us are victims of the occupation. And, uh, but, you know, unless he does it formally, and I don't even know if he can, 
unless he gets permission from the guys who run the um, the Fatah prison hierarchy would allow him to do that. But as I told you, it's really not all that important to me anymore. With him. In the, yeah, the because he would be gone, you know, and that face wouldn't be there anymore and there would be no need. And that's really, it's not even escapism anymore. It's like, okay, enough, being there, you know. Right. And it, let me just say this, though, and ask you, um, so and with many of the victims, survivors, and victors um, like you that we work with, um, they're concerned about intergenerational trauma. And obviously that's what you have there and that it gets passed on from generation to generation. So I was thinking as you were speaking that you've come to a place of peace and that happened quite early in your life after the death of David, um, but also reaching that man who's still in prison and changing his thoughts, his heart, his mind would be important too. But that's not your responsibility, obviously. That's not, right? But well, I think I reached out, you know, and if he would like, I would meet him. It's not as if now I'm saying I won't. I'm right. saying I will if it happens. Right, right. It was much more urgent for me like five, six years ago. Uh, it's not so urgent anymore. I am so busy with the work, with an ongoing conflict here, with a war that is terrifying because nobody knows what the end of this is going to be. Right. And so much death around around us and so much not, um, so much violence and anger. And you can, it's palpable. You can feel it coming off the streets. And, you know, they've stopped talking about the rockets, but there were 30 rockets uh, shot into Tel Aviv today near, near my house. So, um, now, are you in a safe room now as you speak? Are you so, in a safe room? Yeah, I've got a safe room. And aren't I lucky? You know, yes. what about all these people that live in Gaza and have no safe room? And then you understand why all of these things, how do, how do people grow up to be adults that are capable of the barbarity that happened on the 7th of October? And what yes. kind of kids are going to grow up? in the towns that are bordering Gaza, how much hatred and how much fear, it's mainly fear are they going to experience because yeah. their lives, I mean, okay, you know, rockets, this whole nation and the Palestinian nation will be in trauma for years after this because also I look at the, the same grandson. They went through COVID, so there was no school for ages. And then this war now, so as you know, these kids are also traumatized. Yes. I don't know where they're going to find enough space to, to grow up and, and be happy and have fun and, you know, and not have Girl. this. Yes. So, so when we were talking last time before this podcast, I remember you telling me about the work um, that the Parent Circle Families Forum does in schools. And you had mentioned to me that um, before October 7th, there was an annual event. Why don't you describe that and also the fact that you had well, trouble getting did. it? I actually did because I told you about the ceremony that we have every year. That's an annual event. But what the government was trying to do, firstly, the government there in that event had been for three years running, trying to prevent the Palestinians from coming to the ceremony, and for three years we've gone to the Supreme Court and joyously won. You can't imagine the sense of satisfaction of beating the system. And um, recently, if you would have spoken to me a month before October the 7th, um, I would have said to you, I would have told you that the government is now trying, has banned us from going into schools. Um, this is appalling. I mean, for 20 years, the Parent Circle had been the only peace organization from both sides that was allowed to go into schools and tell their personal story. And the first time that a 17-year-old ever met a Palestinian in their lives or heard a story of loss and transformation. And uh, so we became very much a, a part also of all the demonstrations that happened before October the 7th, about the, the role of democracy. 
um, what was missing for that from those whole demonstrations was actually talking about the occupation. But that's another whole a whole right. thing to talk about. So, so why? It's kind of an obvious question or answer, I guess. But why do you think you were blocked the the work of the circles? When you touch somebody's belief system, they get scared. You know, and uh, actually, the minister of police, who was just a member of go- of the government before, and is now the minister of police, came to schools where we were giving lectures and stood outside demonstrating, um, wrapped in a flag. I loathe flags altogether. I think they just separate people, and uh, did his best to stop to stop the schools. You know, to to convince the kids. And 16, 15, 17 year old kids like, you know, this charismatic character that's screaming outside their school um, could easily be swept away with the idea that I'm disloyal and that my Palestinian partner is a terrorist. And um, so this is, we're kind of threatening in a way. Amazing. So, so, it- would you be banned from speaking or just when you appear with Palestinians? No, no, we can't go into the schools because it's a, a deal. We don't go into the schools on our own. So many of the headmasters who've been working with us for many, many years um, said they're not going to listen to the Ministry of Education. They're going to invite us anyway. And we started to do a lot of dialogue meetings outside outside of the schools. Um, we even did one outside the house of the Minister of Education, which filled me with great joy because that was like, it's a bit naughty, but nevertheless. And uh, we did every Saturday night with the demonstrations before the demonstration started in the same place we would have a dialogue meeting. And you can't not be affected by the personal story because our work is all about the personal story. It's also about teaching people how to tell their personal story. You know, it doesn't mean because you lost somebody, you know how to tell the story in a compact way and not be all over the place. It's part of the work that we do is working with the person to learn how to tell their story and to take the salient points. Yes, this is a might sound like a strange question, but I asked um, Bassam the same question in my podcast with him. Um, what are your views of Netanyahu? Um, I've, I've firstly, they would be personal, and I'm sure anybody in our group would agree with me. But I think it's time for him to go. I thought it was time for him to go before he even started some many, many years ago. And um, he's so in such a complex situation with himself and the law and he must be gone as soon as possible, but not only him. This was, the pre- the past government was a fascist government. However, the parent circle is not affiliated to any political party. We're not a, a, a political party. Of course, anybody who works with the sort of work that we do is political by nature. Any peace work is political. Have you or anyone in parent circle had contact with Netanyahu? I certainly haven't had any contact with him, and uh, there's no need to. At one point, when there was a government that was more, um, there's never been a really leftist government, but say a middle right government, then we had uh, talks within the parliament with many of the members of parliament, and we created a small lobby uh, for to understand that there has to be reconciliation. But at this point, you know, one doesn't know, and it's so, you know, everybody wants instant solutions. And, of course, the whole world has now become major experts on the Middle East. Students are walking out of their studies, and the Jewish students are locked in their rooms, and um, others are being attacked, and they are removing religious symbols from their doors because of the anti-Semitism and the Islamophobia. And instead of just learning something, you know, they're talking about the river to the sea. They have no idea what they're talking about. Find out first. Actually, I'm on my way 
in next month, I will be at the World Bank in, in Washington with a Palestinian partner. We're going to do a dialogue meeting there. And then we will be in Georgetown and various other universities. They need to see that they are importing our conflict into their country and what they are doing is creating hatred between Jews and Muslims. It seems okay, though, to hate Jews now. I was just going to respond to, to um, um, your comment about Netanyahu. It seems um, that whether it's um, a, a leader like Netanyahu or anyone else um, who's in a, a place of power, they need to hear your stories. So I just hope that the stories have been heard. Um, because the stories do make that space to, to open people's hearts um, when when the well, conflict. Even the hardest of heart can't resist somebody like Bassam, you know, coming in. And yes, uh, some of them hear them. But um, I think now we are in such a strange place here. And people want it to happen overnight and it won't. Yes, yes. Grieve, they must be able to breathe. What much of the work that we will be doing now is to meet with those families. Many of them came from the left anyway, who had lost in the South, and just to sit and listen to their story. Yes, yes. Uh, so, a couple last questions. Um, what do you think people should um, understand about the uh, conflict when, we, when we're looking at what's happening there? Um, from outside, what do you want them to understand? That they shouldn't import my conflict into their country. That's what I want them to understand. And that they should be more informed. And that they shouldn't start a campaign uh, against Jews or against Muslims because they have a belief in one or the other. And um, if they can't be part of the solution, it's actually better to leave us alone. On the other hand, that, that doesn't mean that you can criticize what is going on in Israel. That, I think, is legitimate. But it's not legitimate to take it into the Jews. You know, I, um, when you look at what's going on in the world, what's going on in Sudan and in the Congo, and thousands and thousands of people get killed, the Houthis and, you know, but nobody seems to think that you, it isn't translated into it's because of the Jews. Nobody starts hating uh, people, although that's not true exactly, because with the war in Ukraine, many Americans became anti-Russian for the people that lived in America who were Russian. It's ridiculous. It's also importing a conflict instead of being part of how, how to solve this. And if you can't be a part of how to solve, leave us alone. Okay. And I, I remember you've said um, in recent days that it's important to you to, for others not to take sides. Well, that's what I've just said. If you're pro-Israel or you're pro-Palestine, how does that help me and Lila? How? If you're going to do something practical, you know, if you feel very bad, then come to Israel or come to Palestine and try to be uh, part of a solution, or tell a story to your congressman about what's happening in the West Bank, for instance. So many people, you know, everything becomes like it's um, the fashion, the flavor of the day is Gaza. But what's happening in the West Bank is atrocious. Nobody talks about that. And Ukraine, everybody's forgotten that Ukraine even existed. Whereas like two months ago, Ukraine you couldn't open a news broadcast without talking about Ukraine. And that is so shallow. I think it makes the world look very shallow. Yes. So so one last question, and then I'll have you make um, closing comments. Uh, this is probably a, a very simplistic question, but what do you think can bring a lasting peace to the region? Talk. If we don't start talking to each other, and you don't make peace with enemies. So, and that's my last statement. I mean, what more can I say? If we, it, you know, we have this big um, saying in the parent circle, it won't stop until we talk. And yes. that's really true. And we yes. have to do that. We have to. We can Dialogue. Repeating the same, it didn't work before and it won't work now. 
And you can't kill ideas. You can change the conditions so that those ideas are not important anymore. But you can't kill an idea. Yes. Well, any other closing comments, Robbie? You've said a lot. No. So, <laughs> well, we're, we're proud to have you um, in hearing your story and putting it out um, and working as much as we can with you and others with the Parent Circle. We, RJI never heard of Parent Circle until October 7th. Um, so now we know, and it, what you're doing, the work you do, and Bassam and others is really a reflection of restorative justice and living it and bringing it to places of conflict and war. Well, you spoke to Bassam and I, but don't forget there are another, like, 700 families yeah. <laughs> that you could do, you could interview. You yeah. know, some of them may not speak English, but it would be, they would have stories just just as poignant and just as um, interesting. Yes, as well, whatever we can do to um, bring restorative justice to bear. Um, yeah, some have thought when we've taken positions on uh, the Ukraine war and then this one, and we mentioned the need for restorative justice, I think we were laughed at for that concept, the idea that restorative justice applies to um, violent conflict and war, but it does. Well, you can actually imagine what kind of talkbacks I got about uh, saying to release the man who killed David. So um, you just have to have a skin like a rhinoceros. <laughs> That's not fair on the rhinoceros. I like <laughs> it. But you have to have a very thick skin and you have to really believe what you're saying. That's right. And then it becomes irrelevant. Yes. Well, thank you so much for bringing hope. To so many, and that's what you do by you're speaking out every day. So we thank you for being on this podcast, Robbie, and I'm glad to know you. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, you. and we'll put this up. Good. Thank you, and blessings Bye -bye. on your work. Thank this you. is Lisa Ray for RJI. Thanks for listening to this episode of the RJI podcast series with Lisa Ray. Stay in touch and support our work at restorativejusticeinternational.com.